Hi geographers, in this statistical skills lesson we're going to be having a look at the chi-squared test, um, trying to understand a little bit about how it works and applying that understanding to a few examples of the ways in which we can use this test. I'm going to start by thinking about what we would actually use the chi-squared test for and there's actually a couple of situations where it would be useful and each approach works in a slightly different way although it does work on the same principles. So so the first situation that we might use the chi-squared test in is just with one set of data. So if we wanted to see whether our observed sample, some data that we had collected through field work, if we wanted to see whether or not there was a pattern within that data, we could compare it to an expected distribution. And this would show us if there is a statistically significant pattern within one set of data. So that's the most straightforward, most simple way that we can use the chi-squared test. For example, we might have a bar chart with different categories and we could see whether or not one of those bars is statistically significantly higher than another, for example. Another situation where we can use the chi-squared test is to determine whether the distributions of two samples so let's imagine that we've collected data from two places or at two points in time. If we wanted to see whether they were connected or independent of each other, this would tell us again whether or not there's a statistically significant pattern within our set of data. Does the data for one place or point in time vary significantly from the other? That second way of using the chi-squared test is a little bit more complicated. We're going to go through each of the examples in this video and there are some practice examples that you can have a go at as well. I've just put up here the list of instructions that you would need to follow in order to complete the chi-squared test. And this is just really for one set of data. When we have two sets of data, we have to do something a little bit more complicated with the expected values. We'll come on to see what that is a little bit later. First thing to note though, we need to make sure that we establish a null hypothesis to start with. Chi-squared always works on this premise that there is no significant difference between the observed data, as in the data that we have collected through some field work, and the expected distribution. So we would expect there to be no pattern and chi-squared will tell us whether that's true or not. Just like some of our other statistical techniques like Spearman's rank and standard deviation, we start by creating a table with our data in it. And within that table, we're gonna have some expected values and some observed values. So just to reiterate, those observed values are the data that we have collected. That represents O in the equation here. And the expected values are ones that we will work out in a minute. Okay, and that represents E in the equation. So when we have O and E, we can very simply uh, fill in the rest of that calculation. Just to point out as well, this letter here, this is the Greek letter chi, hence the name chi-squared. Once we've got those O and E values, we can subtract e from o we can square that value and then we can divide it by e and then we can add all of those values up and that will give us our chi-squared result so it's very straightforward that really just filling in the table in the correct way will give us the result that we need we don't actually need to then substitute any numbers into this equation we can use a table to calculate all of those things Let's have a go at this worked example together. So I want you to imagine that we have been to the beach and we've visited five sites along a beach, we've labeled them, labeled them here, one, two, three, four, and five. And at each site, I have collected a sample of pebbles and I've measured the number of pebbles that were over five centimeters. So that's what these numbers on the y-axis of this graph represents. Not very clear, I should have labelled that. So in site one, for example, there were nine pebbles that were over five centimetres in size. And at site five, 
there were 19 pebbles that were um, over five centimeters in length. So I could be looking to see whether or not there is enough of a difference within this data for it to be statistically significant. Now, it would be very easy to look at this bar here and think, yeah, that's higher than the others. Um, and it's certainly quite a bit higher than this one. So there must be some kind of pattern here on the beach that the stones are getting larger as I go from site one to site five. Now, unless we use statistics, we can't actually be confident that that pattern is a real one that exists and that it's not something that could just be occurring by chance. We need to know, is this bar significantly higher than all the others in order for it to actually mean something statistically. So over to our table then. You can see here we've laid it out. So we've got each of our five sites and I've put my observed values, that's the data that I've collected, into this first column. Now remember that the chi-squared test relies on the concept of a null hypothesis. OK, so in this case, our null hypothesis would be that there is no significant difference in pebble size between sites one to five on the beach. Doing the chi-squared test will tell me whether that's true and there's no significant difference or if that's false and that there is a significant difference. So the chi-squared test is very much a kind of yes or no answer. OK, it doesn't tell me how much more different it is, um, although technically the higher the number, the higher the value for chi-squared, the more significant the difference is. But really, statistically speaking, it's just giving us a yes or no answer. So if this was true, if there was no significant difference in the pebble size between sites one to five, I would expect to find the same number of stones at every point, wouldn't I? If there was no difference at all, I would have the same number of large stones at each of those five sites. So that becomes my expected value. So I have to add all of these figures together, which gives me 70. And then I divide that by the number of sites that I've got, which is five. So on average, I would be expecting to find 14 large stones at each of those sites. If there was no pattern, which my null hypothesis suggests there wouldn't be, I would expect to find no difference between those sites. I can now do the next step in that equation. So I can do the observed value, 9, minus the expected value. So in this case, minus 5. I can do 12 minus 14, which becomes minus 2. 16 minus 14 becomes 2. 14 minus 14, there's no difference. And 19 minus 14 gives me 5. I can then square those results. So 5 fives are 25. Remember when you square a negative number, the negative symbol disappears. 2 twos are 4, so that can go in both of those. 0 squared is 0, and 5 squared again is going to be 25. Next, we then divide O minus E squared, which was this number we've just calculated, by E, which remember is 14. So 25 divided by 14 is 1.786. 4 divided by 14 is 0.286. I know that's going to be the same for this one. 0 divided by 14 is always going to be 0. And 25 divided by 14, I did that calculation up here. So that will also be 1.786. I can then sum those values together, which gives me 4.14.
to two decimal places. As I've said down here, on its own, the chi-squared statistic has very little meaning. We actually need to compare it against some critical values in order for us to determine whether or not we can accept that hypothesis. As I mentioned earlier, generally the higher that number, the bigger the difference or variation there is. But we can see four is a relatively small number, so we need to be careful here to see whether or not this is enough of a difference to be statistically significant. So this is where our confidence levels and our critical values come in. Just before we move on, I'm going to write our result down here, which was 4.14, just before I forget what our chi-squared result was. So the first thing we need to do is to, to decide which confidence level we want to use. So most commonly in geography, when we're looking at statistics, we look at either the 95 or 99% confidence levels, which are indicated by these two numbers here. Okay, this represents both of these numbers, the likelihood of a random result. Okay, the likelihood that that pattern could have occurred at random. 0 0.05, that's the same as being 95% confident because there's a 5% chance that the result is random. This number here is the same as being 99% confident because there's a 1% chance the result is random. If you've looked at the Spearman's rank calculations before, then this is exactly the same principle. There are two numbers and one of those numbers represents a lower level of confidence than the other. So in this case, this first column represents 95% confidence in our result and the second column represents 99% confidence in our result. We need to be higher than this 95% level in order to accept our hypothesis. The next thing we need to consider are what are known as the degrees of freedom. In other words, which number we're looking at down here. Okay, so this is calculated normally as n minus 1, okay, where n is the number of data sets and then we subtract one from that. So the example we used, there were five observations, five sites along the beach. So five minus one is four. So we would use the four row from the degrees of freedom. We would be looking at this row here. Okay. So the next thing we need to understand is whether or not our result means we should accept the null hypothesis or reject the null hypothesis. So a bit like Spearman's rank, if our result is greater than this number, then we can accept our hypothesis and reject our null hypothesis. OK, so we would say that there is a significant pattern here. If, however, our result is lower than this number, then we have to accept our null hypothesis and we have to accept that there's no significant difference between the observed and expected values. So in this case, our result was 4.14. 4.14 is definitely lower than 9.48. So unfortunately, we cannot accept our hypothesis here. We'd have to accept our null hypothesis that there is no significant difference between the observed values and the expected values. So even though site 5 and site 1 look to be quite different, this statistical test has told us that we cannot accept our result. Okay, over to you this time. What you have here is a, some data for a student that's investigating uh, the housing characteristics in an area of a town. They have collected the following data from a hundred people. So they have got um, the housing type that each of those 100 people live in, whether they own the house and whether that's with a mortgage or not, whether they rent the house, um, whether that's privately or not, 
or whether it's some other arrangement. Maybe they live with their parents or something like that. And again, you can see that they've presented that data in a bar chart. And this value here, rented for council or social housing, appears to be significantly higher than the others. However, we must do a statistical test in order to see whether or not that is correct. So I would like you to have a go at firstly establishing a null hypothesis, then conducting a chi-squared test and using this table, interpreting your result. So pause the video now and have a go at that on your worksheet. Let's have a look and see whether you are correct here. I am just gonna fill in the data into the table so we can see what you should have found for your result of the chi-squared test. Hopefully you manage to complete your table in this way and then if you add all of those values together your result is 45.5. So that is the result of our chi-squared test. The sum of O minus E squared divided by E is 45.5. On to then our critical values. We firstly need to make sure we had our null hypothesis. Hopefully you had something like this that there is no significant pattern or no significant difference within patterns of home ownership within this area. We then need to look at our critical values and you should have been looking here because we have one, two, three, four, five categories. You should have subtracted one from there and been again looking at this row here for four degrees of freedom. And in both cases, our result of 45 is higher than that value. Okay, so in this case, we can reject the null hypothesis and we can say with 99% confidence, because we're above that number, that um, this shows there is a statistically significant pattern. And as I said, we can accept 99% confidence level um, in, in terms of accepting our hypothesis or rejecting our null hypothesis with 99% confidence in that result. So in this case, the result was significant and that is a big enough difference to be statistically valid. So that's how we go about using the chi-square test where we have one set of data or we have measured one variable like housing type or pebble size on a beach. If, however, we had measured the pebble sizes on two different beaches um, or we had looked at housing ownership in two different parts of a city, then we would need to use the chi-square test a little bit differently. So that's what we're going to have a look at now. So this time we're going back to consider this use of the chi-square test here to, dis to determine whether or not the distribution of two samples of data are independent of each other, as in they are not connected, they do not have the same patterns, that they are basically significantly different from each other. Okay, so we will be able to use the chi-squared test to tell us whether the two places or times or sets of data are different enough from each other to be statistically significant. This is where things get a little bit more complicated because when we're working with two sets of data, as we're going to see in a moment, we need to make sure that we maintain the correct proportions between those data sets. 
So it's possible that we might have a different number of people in one data set than another, or a different number of stones in one set than another. And that means that when we calculate our expected values, we do not divide them equally. Okay, so the way that we did that earlier, we added up all the observed values and we divided by the number of categories and we got an average value. And that's why we had 14 in every expected value or 20 in every expected value. We don't do that for this type of chi-squared test. We have to calculate the expected values using this equation here. Now this looks a bit complicated and it doesn't really make much sense until we look at it in context in a minute. Once we've done that though, the rest of the calculations are the same, as in we are just going to do O minus E squared divide by E and then add it up. Once we've got the expected values and we've calculated those in the right way, the rest of the test is identical. We go through that same process of O minus E, O minus E squared, O minus E squared divided by E and then add them all up. That will give us our chi-squared result. Here's an example of what I mean. So I want you to imagine that we wanted to have a look at the different ethnic groups living in West Dorset and Newham. So part of Dorset and part of uh, the city of London, Newham. And our null hypothesis is that there is no significant difference between the ethnic groups in West Dorset and the proportion of different ethnic groups living in Newham. Even though maybe when we've drawn a graph of this, we could see some significant differences, we'd always want to use a statistical test to help us prove whether or not that is a significant difference. So what we need to do here to calculate our expected values, we need to think about using the totals of the rows and the totals of the columns to help us do this. So you'll notice we've got a different number of people living in West Dorset. These are these numbers are given in thousands, by the way. So we have 117,000 people in West Dorset and 306,000 people living in Newham. So we wouldn't expect the expected values to be the same for West Dorset and Newham because we've got a different number of people. So that wouldn't make sense. And again, we're not looking for a pattern within the data for West Dorset because we would use the other version of the chi-squared test. Here, we're looking for the difference between them. So is 97 and 89, or 8 and 14, or 9 and 133, or 2 and 60? Are they significant differences? They do look to be, but we want to be, be sure of that. So we use this calculation here to help us work out the expected values. So we have to do the sum of the row multiplied by the sum of the column divided by n. And n in this case is the total number of people that we have got in our sample. So 423 or 423,000 here. So if we wanted to work out the expected value for white ethnic groups in Dorset, we would need to do the sum of the row that it is in, which is 186, because that's 97 plus 89, multiplied by the sum of the column that it is in, which is 117, divided by n, which is our total down the bottom there, 423. So if we were to do that, 186 times 117 divided by 423, we would get 51.4. So our expected value would be 51.4. What I'd like you to do now, just pause the video and see if we can work out what would the expected value be for mixed ethnicities in West Dorset what would the expected value be there? So hopefully this time you went through that same process. The sum of the row is 22. The sum of the column is still 117. And we're still dividing it 
by 423. So our answer should be 6.1. Well done if you got that. Again, let's do one more together. Can you pause the video now and work out for me what the expected value would be for white people in Newham? Okay, so this time, hopefully you did the sum of the row, which was 186, multiplied by the sum of the column, which was 306, divided by 423 to give you 134.6. That's what we should have here as our expected value. So I'm just going to whiz down and put all of those expected values in in the right place. Okay, so now we've worked out our expected values we would need to go through the same process that we went through before of doing O minus E squared divided by E. Okay, and then adding those up at the end. Now, you might be wondering how we do that with two columns of data, you know, two columns of O and two columns of E. It doesn't matter now that we can just lump all of those expected and all of those observed values together in one table. So that's what I've done here. I've just taken that column for Newham and I've put it underneath the column for West Dorset. So our values that we calculated earlier are in there. So our expected value for white ethnic groups in West Dorset was 51.4. Our mixed ethnicities was 6.1. Our white ethnic groups in Newham was 134.6. So I've just put all of those observed and all of those expected values in the right place down there. The next thing we would do is go about calculating this in exactly the same way as before. So we would start by doing 97 minus 51.4 because that's our observed minus our expected value which gives us 45.6. We could square that number and it would give us 2079 0.36 and then I could divide that by the expected value which was 51.4 and that would give me 40.45 okay same again for the next one I could do O minus E which is 8 minus 6.1 that would give me 1.9 I can square it to give me I could square it to give me 3.61 and I can divide it by 6.1 to give me 0.59. I'm going to give all of these answers to two decimal places. You get the idea then. I'm just going to whiz down and fill in the rest of this table like we've been doing. O minus E, O minus E squared and then divide it by E again. So there we go then, I've done that calculation for each of those observations, O minus E squared divided by E. And then to find our chi-squared result, I just have to add up all of those values, which gives me 108.26. So again, I now need to compare our result to our significance levels and these are exactly the same as the previous test because the test works in exactly the same way it's only calculating the expected values that we've had to do differently the other thing that changes slightly now is which of the degrees of freedom we are looking at here so which of these rows of the table we're looking at because we've got two sets of data we now need to define the degrees of freedom by looking at the number of columns minus one multiply the number of rows minus one. Now, when it mentions columns and rows here, 
That is referring to the columns and rows that we've got in our table, but not this table. It's actually referring to the table that we've got here that we were completing earlier on. And what we have to do here is imagine we're only thinking about the observed data and the number of categories. OK, so in this case, the number of columns that we've got is two, one for West Dorset okay, and, and one for Newham. So we have one column and one here. So that's similarly why I've coloured these in two different colours here. The number of rows that we've got are here. One, two, three, four, five rows, five categories in two places. OK, and that's because you can use the chi-square test for three or four locations. You could you could quite easily do that in exactly the way that we've done here. So when we're working out our degrees of freedom, it's the number of columns, which is two. And the number of rows, which is five. So in this case, we are doing the number of columns minus one multiplied by the number of rows minus one. So we have two columns minus one multiplied by five rows minus one. So that's the same as doing one times four. OK, one times four is four. So again, we are looking at this set of numbers here in our table. So again, we can see 108.26. That is definitely higher than both of those. So as a result of that, we could reject our null hypothesis that there is no difference between West Dorset and Newham. And we could do that with 99% confidence. You can never be 100% confident, but we could do that with 99% confidence in our result because our result is higher than that number and that number there. If it was lower, we wouldn't be able to be confident. We'd have to accept the null hypothesis and accept that there was no difference in those two areas. Over to you then. You've got some data here which um, shows that a student has collected a sample of pebbles at two ends of a beach. So you can see the beach that they've used here. They've gone to the western end of that beach and then they've gone to the eastern end of that beach and they've collected a sample of pebbles um, at each end and they wanted to see whether or not the pebbles are getting more rounded as they go towards the end of that beach. What they've done is they've measured the pebbles using what's called powers scale of roundness. So they've picked the pebble up and they've looked at it and they've basically given it one of these six categories here. They've either decided that it's very angular, angular, sub-angular, and so on, all the way up to well-rounded. So that's what these letters mean at the bottom of this graph here. Very angular, all the way up to well-rounded. And we can see the blue bars for the western end tend to be kind of skewed a little bit more this way, don't they? And the orangey coloured bars for the eastern end seem to be skewed a little bit more that way. But we can't be confident in that result unless we've used a statistical test to tell us objectively whether or not there is a significant difference between those two sets of data. So what I'd like you to have a go at doing is calculating the chi-squared result for that set of data. You've got the data in the table here and you've also got um, the table that you'll need to use when you come to actually perform the calculations. Remember, the first thing you've got to do is calculate the expected values using this equation here. The sum of the row multiplied by the sum of the column divided by n. Once you've done that, you're going to take those expected values and you're going to put them into this column here. And then you'll be able to carry on the rest of that test. And then you need to remember to do that calculation there to find the degrees of freedom that you need to look at in this table. So you need to know which of these rows you need to have a look at in the table. So quite a lot to do there, but pause the video now and have a go at trying to work that out. If 
by all means you need to rewind the video and go and have a look at the example again then do that and then come back to this and have a go at working those different stages out okay i'm going to go through the answers now and i'm going to sort of reveal it in stages so you can see how you got on with this so the first thing that you should have is your expected values in the table here and you didn't do anything wrong by ending up with the same values for the eastern end and the western end and that's because we've got the same number of pebbles in each of those samples there were 50 pebbles at each site so don't worry about the fact that you ended up with uh, a mirror image um, at the top and bottom of that table that's absolutely fine that's what you should have had so just scroll down and just check you got those expected values right if you didn't then pause the video correct the expected value and then go on and correct the rest of your calculation if you did get those right then well done and hopefully the rest of your table fitted together like that rather than having to check every value see what your overall result was did you get 9.79 there if you did great um, if not you've done something wrong earlier on in those stages next thing we needed to do then was to compare our result to these um, critical values these degrees of freedom so in terms of finding our degrees of freedom you should have done the number of columns minus one which was again one because we had two columns the eastern end and the western end and we had this time six rows very angular angular sub angular sub rounded rounded and well rounded okay so six minus one is five so one times five is five so we should have been looking at these numbers here okay so in this case our result 9.79 is not higher than this or this so therefore we actually have to accept our null hypothesis we have to say that there is no significant difference between the eastern and western end of that beach so even though when we looked back at that when we looked back at that bar graph which showed that the eastern end seemed to be higher there and the western end seemed to be a bit higher there it's not a significant enough difference for us to actually be confident in that result so well done if firstly you managed to calculate the correct chi-squared result that you managed to find the correct row of the table to have a look at and you came to the correct conclusion that we cannot accept our hypothesis we have to accept our null hypothesis so we're very upset here that there's not a significant difference between the east and western ends of the beach well done if you managed to do all of those three things that concludes our session on the chi-squared test the second way of doing it with two sets of data is a little bit more complicated but hopefully you can see there once you've worked out those expected values it's exactly the same format then to complete the test and exactly the same way of interpreting the result and this is another really really useful test for us as geographers we can use it in lots of context in both human and physical geography the only time that we should be careful of using the chi-squared test is really when any of our expected values are less than three so in theory actually the example that we looked at here for West Dorset and Newham um, one of our expected values got down just down to three okay so if that had been any lower then we would have been um, a little bit uh, a little bit on dodgy ground for using that test there so just be mindful of that if you're coming to apply this to any of your own data 
if your expected values are less than three, then there's maybe a different test that you want to have a look at. The Mann-Whitney U test might be more appropriate for you.